quarter race for the winner. What are we doing today? What's the game plan? The game plan is um, first, I think, to say a couple, more, uh, a couple more words about the quantization of masses fields. Um, I never did the little group of the masses for it, but it's more than that. And then, um, then um, I'll show that the current, the standard current in QED is conserved. So that, that allows us to use the nice photon propagator, the one that's covariant. And then, um, and then I wanted to do uh, electron-positron scattering. Um, so maybe I should start. Now. All right. So let's let me just. Um, I don't want to go through the whole nine yards. That's the trouble with Weinberg. I mean, it's both the virtue and the trouble with Weinberg is. And he um, drives everything in complete generality and basic principles, which is great if you want the whole story, but not so great if you only have a finite lifetime. Um, okay, so we have some fiducial state, and uh, in general, this is the way we define a state of momentum P spin S or spin index S, we define it this way. This is a unitary transformation. This takes this vector, throws it into the vector P. Uh, L of P is some standard um, Lorentz transformation. And this is some standard fiducial vector. Now, in the case of massive particles, we always took the fiducial vector to be the particle at rest. And we took the S to be spin in the Z direction. Um, in the case of a massless particle, we don't have that option. And uh, we have to have the particle moving in some direction at the speed of light. And in fact, um, what we'll do is we'll say that the particle is moving in the Z direction at the speed of light. But that still gives us an arbitrary momentum here. So I'm doing uh, some remarks on the quantization of massless particles that uh, I skipped over. So the fiducial, we have to pick some k arbitrarily, and that will be our uh, fiducial vector, some momentum in the z direction. And um, so then the little, whereas if, the, if, if with massless particles we could have this particle at rest, the um, little group, that is to say the transformations that leave the k invariant was, was the rotation group. Here it's going to be uh, more complicated. Let me mention what L of p is. It's some r of um, p hat and then some b of p. And in fact, this is convention. Weinberg takes this conventionally as uh, minus i p j3 minus i theta j2 and then b p which is a boost in the c direction it doesn't stand for British Petroleum. Um, uh, let's think about u of lambda on p s well that you know you rewrite that as u of l the standard boost to momentum lambda p and then you write it as u of L inverse of lambda p, lambda L of p on k of s. And you realize that L inverse of lambda p, lambda L of p on k, this takes it to, takes you to L inverse, whoops, equal sign there, L inverse lambda p, lambda, well L of p on k is of course p, because this is the standard Lorentz transformation that takes you from k to p. This take, you're now at lambda p, but then this is the standard boost. L of lambda p is the standard Lorentz transformation that takes you from k 
k lambda p, so L inverse takes lambda p back to k. So this is k. So in other words, um, w defined as L inverse of lambda p, lambda L of p, um, is uh, a Lorentz transformation that takes k to k, where k is this fiducial vector. Um, k is a 1, 0, 0, 1, k. I put it as 1, 0, 0, 1. Um, that's kind of silly because normally we'd say, I should have said k. I would have said k like that. Okay. Now, what are the Lorentz transformations that do that? Well, we'll say, let's look at the infinitesimal ones, and uh, that means that W on K should be zero, and the ones that annihilate it are then uh, zero A, B, zero A, zero minus theta, minus A, B, theta, zero minus B, zero, A, B, zero. You can say this take, you can see this takes, this sends K to zero. The structure here, this is the rotation, this is the rotation around the z-axis. Uh, the A and the B are combinations, it turns out, of boosts and um, uh, boosts and rotations. And altogether, this omega, you can rewrite it um, as A, B1. I'm using the notation in my notes on the Lorentz group. A, B1 plus B, B2 minus A, R2 plus B, R1 plus theta, R3. And I'm going to skip us some lines in the notes, which have been online for a while. Um, a, K1 minus J2 plus B, K2 plus J1 plus theta, J3. Okay, so these are the, um, let's see, it's kind of, somebody set this at 80. All right, so this is um, the expression. The, the I comes from the fact that, you know, normally you, do this razzmatazz where you stick an eye and then put another eye. I expect that with quantum mechanics it's pulling the true it may stop that nonsense, but it's conventional now. By the way, I learned um, last night that uh, Weinberg is writing a book on quantum mechanics. Um, I hope it'll become the standard text. Okay, so if you set T1 equal to J2 minus K1 and T2 equal to minus J1 minus K2, what you find out is that T1 commutes with T2. And you also find out, I'm going to be skipping through this somewhat more quickly than I would you find that this at J3 commutator T1 is I T2 and J3 commutator T2 is minus I T1. So J3 rotates T1 into T2. Uh, T1 and T2 have the commutation relations of translations in the XY plane and J3 a rotation about the Z axis rotates T1 into T2. There's supposed to be eyes in front of the K's? There's supposed to be eyes here. In front of everything? Yeah. There are eyes inside the K's and the J's because <laughs> the... How many K's are on there? Yeah, yeah, all right. You're not here. I'm not here. If I wanted to see something else in class. Did somebody else ask you a question? You asked a question. No. Oh, I don't want to hear. I, I, well, I do have I a mean, question. Like, like last time we, we, had, <laughs> we had Hermitian and like, 
not hermitic. I mean, we have rotation plus boost, right? When we were doing this last time, with not the massless particles. Well, let's see. Uh, I forget, I forget exactly. Well, a, Lorentz, a general Lorentz transformation is a rotation and a boost. Uh -huh. And that's most clear for the infinitesimal ones that are literally rotation plus boost. And the boost we redefined as some... Yeah, but you can toss in those eyes. In yeah, other yeah. words, K1 is, I don't remember if it's IB1 or minus IB1. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, you can tell. it's I, K1 is IB1, so minus II gets you back to this. Okay, okay. It's somewhat infantile, but okay, it's yeah. also conventional. But for a massive particle, the Wigner rotations were just rotations. Absolutely, right? yes. And now they're not. They're boosts and rotations. That's right. And so these T1 and T2, these combinations of J and K, act like translations? Yeah. Okay. Weird. Okay. Um, it gets worse. Um, so the the big now the, the the little group. So W is in what um, is called ISO2, something I never heard of until I read this in Weinberg, and um, it's basically uh, oh, and something interesting about ISO2 is that you see it has an abelian subgroup. That's invariant because J3 just turns J uh, T1 into T2, so the Lie algebra is invariant under uh, the action of the whole group. That means that the Lie algebra is neither simple nor semi-simple, and um, anyway, that's a bad thing. I take it. It means that the, 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 the structure is more complicated than, than um, you'd expect. <laughs> or as Weinberg says, more interesting. Um, the upshot is that when u of w acts on ks, what we, we can rewrite it as minus i a k1 minus j2 minus i b k that must be k2 minus oh god what is this k1 minus j2 that makes sense well it's got to be k2 Well, it could be K2 plus K1, actually. So I think there's a mistake here in the notes. But it's not going to matter. Because, um, whoops, hold on. This is a J3. OK. But this means you have spin S in the three direction. And so this is an eigenstate of that. And so what we get is. This first term, e to the minus a, say k1 minus j2 minus i b, k2 plus j1 minus i theta s, k s. And now, what Weinberg says is that in massless particles, we're not aware of any quantum numbers uh, associated with um, these two operators, in other words, there aren't two extra quantum numbers. And so he says that uh, we'll just take these states to be eigenstates of these two operators, which commute with eigenvalue zero. And so this is just e to the minus i theta s. Theta s. All right, so I just thought, and, and, and that means then that our, our, our formulas are u of lambda, a of p and s, U inverse of lambda is root lambda p0 over p0 e to the i s times some angle that depends upon uh, p and lambda and the well there's no point in taking the adjoint of that it's obvious. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop at this point except to mention that um, in, in the Coulomb gauge, of course, you have delta A equals zero. 
this is not a Lorentz invariant condition. And so when you make a Lorentz transformation, you automatically are making a gauge transformation. This was something that was first emphasized by Subino. Uh, it's one of the inventors of supersymmetry. Um, in fact, he and Wes have been waiting a very long time for a Nobel Prize. Um, if super particles are discovered at the LHC, I imagine they'll get one. Okay, any questions about this? I, I don't want to emphasize this. I find this so a rather mysterious part of Weinberg. And, um, so what does it mean that the state is a, a zero eigenvalue eigenstate of these translations? Yeah. That's, what does that mean? It's kind of weird. Well, it makes the algebra, it makes, makes life simple for us. But, um, so let's not, you know, let's not go into the streets in the Parisian demonstration. Um, but he ditched his first principles. Of, did, was his argument that we don't observe thing, things? That's yeah. That's that's basically what he says. Um, all right. I, I think I'm going to leave this here. I don't want to go further. I I just think it's 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 good to make sure that you you realize that a mass of particles, a little group, is different. And um, so then you might say, well, what about spin one half particles? It turns out for spin one half particles, this stuff really doesn't matter because you can take the um, massless case as the limit of the massive case. But in spin one, you can't, and there isn't an intrinsic difference here, spin one and spin two. All right. Um, if, if, if anyone wants to look into this, more deeply, it's it's not a crazy thing to do because in the standard model, of course, the idea is that before symmetry breaking, uh, all the particles are massless, and so this isn't really an academic issue. On the other hand, it's also true that all the standard model particles, apart from the proton and the graviton, are massless. What what happens for energy spin when when you try to take the limit of zero goes to zero, why, why does that not work out for you? Well, good question. That's a long story. Um, uh, all right, we skipped the quantization of massive spin one particles. Had we done it, we would have found that um, in the propagator, we would have found a one over m squared term that would have that diverges as m goes to zero. So, there's a, so you can't take a smooth limit. On the other hand, if you look, did derive the propagator for spin one half massive particles, and there's no problem at all as m goes to zero. Uh, so when you get a different answer, if you say, I have no mass or half. So spin one is massive and massless are two different things. Okay. And um, I'll just mention the mechanism by which mass occurs for in the standard model. It's the Higgs mechanism in both cases. But the actual mechanism is different. In the case of fermions, what you have is you have something like psi bar. Let me just write it without any indices. This is the good choice. Psi bar phi psi, okay? And then you say, well, in the vacuum, this is in fact, this thing becomes some number. Well, let me put a constant in there. And that constant is such that this becomes m psi bar psi, and that's our mass term. Whereas, in the case of Sorry, is phi the Higgs field? Yes. Good question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Whereas in the case of uh, spin one, what you have is a covariant derivative um, of this Higgs field uh, effectively squared. So let me just, because I'm skipping indices, let me write it this way. And this thing is e mu phi, um, say, plus i e a mu phi squared. So then when phi uh, gets a mean value in the vacuum, what you have is that the mean value of, in the vacuum of d mu squared of this is effectively, um, well, a minus, but let, let, let me just, instead of using equal signs, let me just say you have an e squared, you have uh, whatever phi squared is, let me just write it that way, and then you'll have a mu squared, okay? And the, the mean value in the vacuum of this is, some, is whatever it is, and so, and you, you, you identify this with m squared a mu squared, and I'm, I'm not bothering to raise and lower indices or to get complex. This is actually absorbing squared, that's why this comes in with a plus sign and so forth. Anyway, never mind. The point is that the gauge field then acquires a mass m, and the mass m is of the order of e times the mean value of the Higgs field in the vacuum. And um, so the mechanism by which the gauge fields, the spin one fields, get mass in the, in the standard model, although it involves the Higgs field, it involves the Higgs field in a different way. In fact, in a more geometrical way. This is kind of dumb. Uh, whereas this is, is kind of nice. Oh, this is only for, for fermions? This is for fermions. Okay. And this is for gauge fields. The gauge field is here. Uh -huh. So that could be the photon field, right? Ah, brilliant. Yes, it could be. But in fact, what's involved for the, pho for the photon is you have a, a, a symmetry which is SU2 uh, left across something that's often called B1 or U1. It's often called U1 B. Why does B? I don't remember. But in any event, uh, it's, it's not U1 B, it's U1 Y. And so what's actually involved then is D mu plus say I E um, uh, let me just say I E what all right, let's use T sub Y, T sub Y, T Y times um, uh, B mu plus I, and call this E1 and this E2, and this will be, um, say, sigma over 2 dot, um, I don't want to use W, what am I going to use? Um, Let's just call it C mu for vector. So this whole structure here multiplies phi. So this is the covariant derivative. It's a U1 part. This 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 T Y is just a diagonal matrix with, um, or it's just a, in the case it's a diagonal matrix in which if if, if well. This is D mu V plus that. If phi is a two vector, is a two component spinless field, then this is a two by two matrix that's you can take diagonal, and then this is the these are the regular piling matrices for SU2. And so then what happens is one linear combination of uh, B and C become it remains massless, and another one becomes massive, and then two other components of C are, in other words, the, you have a C3 which is diagonal because the, the sigma 3 is diagonal, so the C3 and the B uh, have, well, I mean, you can just see whatever this thing is, call it AB, 
and then this is going to so this is going to be e one a e one b, and this is going to be plus e two minus e two, and of course I've written them in the wrong way. This is over here uh, e one b minus e two zero zero. So this is this two by two matrix, and um, well, it works. This is a little too simple somehow. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow having to force one of these to be zero. It's actually more natural. Some, uh, so I've screwed something up. When you do it, uh, what you see is you naturally have one eigenvalue that's zero, and that's the photon's mass. And then you have another mass that's big, the z's mass. And then two others that are almost as big, those are the w plus and minus. I mean, there's a component of c multiplying these e twos as well, right? Right, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> all right, anyway, let's let, 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 me, let me not try to continue this. It, let me just say that it works out that you that's how the masses work out. And um, meanwhile, back at, um, at, 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 at QED and You want to know that you're entitled. Alright. So, so now, um, since we're all here, I can start in on the QED. And um, in particular, our interaction Hamiltonian is going to be E J U A mu. Well, integrated. E cubed x, where j mu is psi bar gamma mu. The question is, is this um, a conserved term? Because remember that our razzmatazz last time where we uh, got away with using the nice covariant uh, photon propagator, the one that's simple, in order to do that we had to have a conserved current. So that those terms that were uh, Q mu turned out to be multiplied by J mu, which was conserved. Okay, so let's consider D mu J mu. So this is D mu of psi bar gamma mu psi, and this will be psi bar D mu gamma mu psi plus D mu psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay. We remember the, that, that psi satisfies the Dirac equation. And that means that we can easily replace d mu uh, gamma mu here, psi, with um, minus i m psi. So this is going to be my, minus i m psi bar psi, but now we have to figure out what this is. Well, to do that, we just take the adjoint of this equation. We get minus i d mu psi dagger gamma mu dagger equals m psi dagger. Okay. Now, the reason why Oh, of course, let me remind you here that this is psi dagger gamma zero gamma mu psi. That, that's what psi bar is. And let me also remind you that uh, gamma zero is zero one one zero, in which each of these things is a two by two matrix, and gamma is zero sigma minus sigma zero. Okay. All right, well you can see the gamma, gamma, gamma zero is for mission, but uh, in any event, that's actually kind of irrelevant at the moment. So this is, I'm gonna multiply both sides by gamma mu, gamma uh, zero. I'm gonna have psi dagger 
and the mu dagger and the zero equals m, and right there I just have psi bar. Now, gamma zero, as I said, was the mission. Gamma zero obviously commutes with gamma zero, so the gamma zero can go right through and make this a psi bar. When this is gamma i, though, gamma i is anti-commission because of the minus sign, but on the other hand, it anti-commutes with gamma zero. So the two cancel, and we can multiply through by gamma zero, and what we get then is minus i d mu sub bar. So gamma zero comes through, and the that the oh whoa whoa gamma mu. Got the gamma mu. You just when you pull the gamma mu dagger through the gamma zero, you can drop the dagger. That's the point. You're saying gamma zero commutes with gamma dagger, basically? Gamma, gamma, gamma well, here. Not quite. It's a gamma, z, a gamma mu dagger gamma zero is equal to gamma zero gamma mu. Okay. That's fine. Oh. Right, yeah, okay, so it's correct, yeah. Okay, so. So that means that d mu psi bar gamma mu is equal to i m psi. So this is plus i m psi bar psi. And I should have said a bar on that sign. And that's zero. OK. So indeed, this is a conservative term. That means we can use the nice problem. What uh, what might this represent? <laughs> 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 what might what represent? Go take a bag. <laughs> <laughs> what might what represent? The the current we defined in terms of. Well, this is the electric current, you know, what we use to have lights. <laughs> in terms of, I mean, then by Earth. This is a field, this combination represents the electron. So. Okay. Right. Okay. That means that we can effectively say that the time ordered product of A mu x, A mu y is effectively integral d fourth k over 2 prime of the 4 minus i a to mu nu, the flat space metric, over k squared plus i epsilon, e to the minus i k times x minus 1. Right. OK. All right. So let's consider the process e plus e minus goes to e plus e minus. And now, um, Fermions always raise my blood pressure because they introduce minus sign. The human brain isn't organized to deal with minus sign. So it always causes me uh, difficulties. Well, I think it causes any human being difficulties. All right, so there are two Feynman diagrams. One looks like this, and the other one just looks like this. Whereas this is the particle coming in, the antiparticle coming in, particle going out, antiparticle going out, particle coming in, going out, antiparticle coming in, uh, going out. This is our And as usual, I'm getting X and Y backwards. So the amplitude is. P prime, Q prime. Actually, let me use the same notes but a Xerox copy so I can make corrections as I go. So I'm going to call this P prime, Q prime, time ordered e to the minus i 
integral uh, interaction Hamiltonian of x d fourth x uh, pq, where this is going to be pq p prime q prime p prime q prime q. All right. Now the first subtlety, one that I um, screwed up when I wrote this last night. All right, late at night, I can get away with that. Anyway, two e's, square root of two e's, vacuum, and I'm going to write it this way, p prime a prime minus i e squared over 2 integral time order product h, let me drop the i, okay, h of x, h of y, uh, a dagger, v dagger, vacuum, e cross x, e cross y. So that's what we're dealing with. And, um, Notice a bit of a subtlety here. We can pick any order we want for the, these two operators. This is the creation operator for the electron, creation operator for the positron. But if that's what we pick at the front, then we've got to be consistent and uh, write from in the order B prime, A prime in the final state, which is the adjoint of a an analogous initial state. All right, in other words, a prime dagger, B prime dagger, vacuum, adjoint is vacuum, uh, B prime, A prime. But don't the A and B here? Don't the A and B species commute? The anti commute because they're fermion uh, operators. <laughs> that is a problem. Fermions are such trouble. In fact, you know, this is what I said to you guys in the early part of this. Course. And I said, there's this, this oh, I owe you a candy? No? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, back. <laughs> the, um, with bosons, of course they commute. Moreover, with bosons, um, we don't have all these complicated spinners. Moreover, with bon bosons, we don't, if, if they're massive, we don't have the problem with the little group. And um, although with bosons, that's something that just occurred to me. With bosons, if I'm not mistaken, a spin zero particle that's massless is, I think, in, I remember hearing Sidney Coleman say once that they were, that was intrinsically problematic. If I'm not mistaken, this is some matter of 30 years ago. And I meant to check it out and then did. Um, but so I thought the anti-commutation relations had to do with A and A dagger. They also have to do with A and B. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so what we're dealing with here is A B prime anti-commutator is certainly zero. And then the anti-commutator of A A prime dagger, well, let's just say this, that's also zero. And the same thing, B, B prime, anti-commutator is zero. Well, those are zero. And then A, B dagger, zero. But A, of course, A prime dagger is you know, a delta function. And B, B dagger, anti-commutator is zero. All right. So, um, now we um, so so let's 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 uh, get this uh, straight. What we want to do is we want to let me use this part of the board. We're going to stop um, a dagger at y, and then we get a factor of two. 
okay? And that cancels this factor too. Uh, the minus I squared, of course, gives you a minus sign. And what I'm going to do so that, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to introduce another minus sign by interchanging these two just to make it consistent with my notes. Well, that, that's stupid. I'll, I'll, I'll All right. So this is square root. This is then minus e squared from here, the two go, the square root of the two e's, one e for each of these. So this is p prime q prime p q. p prime a prime integral t psi bar of x gamma mu psi of x a mu of x psi bar of y gamma nu and now this is going to be psi plus of y a nu of y a dagger b dagger vacuum b four of x equal y. So I've just uh, rewritten the whole thing and uh, said that we're going to stop a dagger at 2 and that's what that's what this does because this has the annihilation. Alright, let me remind you what these fields look like. Sine alpha of x is integral dqp 2 pi q square root of 2 ep summed on the two spin states A of P and S U alpha of P and S E to the minus I of PX plus P dagger of P and S V alpha of P and S E to the I of PX and then psi bar alpha of X is the same thing here, same sum, but now it's B of P and S, B bar alpha of P and S, e to the minus I P X, plus A dagger P S, B bar alpha of P S, E to the I P X. And notice there's, there's one thing that's a little bit asymmetrical about the notation, it's that we have a U with an A, but we also have a, a, we have a V, not a V bar or a V dagger or a V star, but a V with a V dagger. And so when we take the adjoint of that field and multiply from the right by gamma zero, we get a V bar here with an annihilation operator. And well, this one is what you'd expect. You'd expect Isn't that just a matter of convention? Yeah, it's 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 a convention. It's a standard notation. And, um, everybody uses this notation. If you can think up a better one, no old that was good. We could just call that one V alpha bar and then we get V alpha over here, right? Right. <laughs> then it would look so much. Yes. <laughs> Well, well, we'll see how that works later on. All right, so, so letting this act, this has a, this will couple with this A dagger, and it stands just right in front of it, so there's, there's no extra minus sign. That's when Y is earlier than X. When Y is later than X, it has to, trundle through these two Fermi fields and it gets uh, two minus signs, but then it has to go through this guy so it gets a third minus sign. But on the other hand, the time ordered product of the the time ordered product of the Fermi fields has this extra minus sign built into it. So we're not going to have to keep track of that explicitly. 
in any event, um, what we've got at this stage is that S is equal to minus E squared, the square root of two E's, all the square root of two EP, zero uh, B prime, A prime, integral T of psi bar of X and of U psi, and I'm going to put a minus sign, minus on that uh, field there, A mu X psi bar Y and a new A new Y. And then this becomes just U of P and S. In other words, what we get is the U and then E to the minus I P Y and um, D dagger zero D four X Now, let's see, why did I say that the minus sign was here? Um, well, it's that somebody has to create an A dagger, or an A dagger prime, actually, and the only Fermi field left that can do it is the psi, uh, because psi creates, hold it. No, I'm sorry, I'm trying to create the positron. The only thing that can create the positron is the psi. So the negative frequency of the side creates that. Um, but, all right, now how, how will this psi minus create it? Well, when x is later than y, it's going to go through like this. It's going to get a minus sign here, a minus sign there, and then it uh, hits this. And so, so there's no extra change of sign there. And so what we get at this stage is that S is equal to minus E squared square root of two E's divided by two E P square root of two E Q prime zero A prime integral T psi bar X gamma mu V, and I'm just going to call this V prime. If we decided that Q's were going to go with, with uh, the inner part of P's with the particle, so just a simple prime would be enough. E to the I, Q prime X. So that's because this was a psi minus, so that would be E to the I, and it would be Q prime X. And then what we have is A mu X psi bar Y gamma nu U A nu Y E to the minus I Q Y E dagger vacuum E fourth X E fourth Y. And I guess we have a Okay. So just to be clear, are the, the sums over the spin are still hanging around in this thing, right? We're just not writing them? Or are they gone? They're, well, yeah, this U, very good. This U uh, will be summing over the, the spin states of the U, yes. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's get, some, no, no, nuance here, no, no is the answer. Okay. Because <laughs> this had a specific spin index in here. Okay, so we didn't know. So we're, and, and the same thing over here. So we don't sum over them unless we decide that we're going to sum over the initial states. Okay? Or the final states. And in fact, what one does, if you're, so the real answer to your question is if, so that is unless the S, the original S? It depends on what we're measuring. Yeah. So the conventional thing is, in other words, in almost all accelerated experiments, 
the B, you don't measure the spins at all. So the average over the initial spin states, and then you compute a probability, and then you sum the probability of the final spin states. All right, so here we are. Okay, now uh, we have to split the thing into two diagrams. If we're looking at this diagram, then, remember this is y and this is x, then b dagger is stopped at y. Okay, so we need something to uh, annihilate uh, the b dagger, that's a sidebar plus, and And so this guy, the positive frequency part of this is going to annihilate it to get this diagram. For the other diagram, it would be the positive frequency part of this field. Okay, so for this diagram, what happens is we get minus e squared root two e's, and now we have almost all of these two e's. And what are we doing? We're doing a cube. 0, A prime, integral T, psi R, X, M, U, B prime, B, I, T prime, X, A, U, X, B e to the minus I, so that's this one, B e to the minus I, Q, Y, and it's because there's a minus sign there, it's a B that's coming out. And what we'll have left behind is a V-bar, gamma nu, the U, this U, a nu of Y, e to the minus I, P, Y, vacuum, P, fourth X, P, fourth Y. And let's just see, it's this one is stopping this one, so there isn't any funny business with a minus sign here. At least when y is earlier. When y is later, there is, but there's a minus sign built into the fermion problem. Fermion time is a problem. Okay. So what's left then is just for this guy to create an A dagger which stops here and um, that just gives us another 2E, the 2E's cancel, we get minus E squared vacuum integral and then we have U bar prime gamma mu V prime E to the I E prime plus Q prime X time order product of A mu of X A nu of Y e to the minus i, p plus q, y, v bar, gamma nu, u, vacuum, and then again to the fourth Okay. So now, the fermions are gone, we can relax. Um, and actually, what I might do is I might invite you guys to go through this somewhat more carefully, putting in the theta zero, the thetas of x zero and y zero, and seeing how these minus signs work out. When it all comes out in the wash, this is what we get. So after all that, I mean, that minus sign in front hasn't changed. Does that always happen? No. Alright, now we know what the photon propagator is, so this gives us minus E squared. So in other words, vacuum, time order product, vacuum. In effect, what we get here is E fourth K over 2 pi to the fourth 
e to the minus i k x minus y over k squared plus i epsilon. You might say, well, is it x minus y or y minus x? It doesn't matter because it's a function of it's an integral over all k with k squared here. So that doesn't matter. And then we have here minus i a to mu nu. And then we have u bar prime gamma mu v prime v bar gamma nu u. And then e to the i p prime plus q prime x minus i p plus q y Okay, B. The uh, eta mu nu just raises this mu, this nu to a, uh, raises the nu and makes it a mu, and so it seems silly to go through and write that again, so this just becomes a mu. The a to mu nu goes away. The minus i comes out. It becomes an i. And so we've got i e squared. Then we do the dy integration. Well, the dy integration, what's the coefficient of y? It's uh, k minus p minus q. So that gives us i e squared integral 2 pi to the fourth cancels delta fourth of k minus p minus q um, over k squared plus i epsilon which is irrelevant u bar prime gamma mu v prime v bar gamma up mu u e to the i p prime plus q prime x and now k I left out the k e, it's e to the minus i kx so, so then d4 of x d4 of y okay so you I'm sorry the d4 of y is gone we just did it to get the delta function we now integrate over k K gets replaced by P plus Q, and we get uh, I e squared integral U bar prime gamma mu V prime V bar gamma mu U E to the I X prime plus Q prime minus P minus Q E plus X and p plus q squared. And so the final answer then is i e squared to pi to the fourth delta four of the p prime plus q prime minus p minus q over p plus q squared and then times all these spinner things which are u bar prime gamma mu v prime v bar gamma mu u. You notice that you have here u bar v prime v bar. That's the kind of thing we saw in our spin sums. So that's that diagram. In the other diagram, um, we don't stop B dagger at Y, we stop it at X. Where is it? Um, you're right. So let me follow my notes. We, we have to stop there. Okay. 
stop b dagger at y. Um, something screwed up in my notes. Um, okay, well, obviously b dagger is stopped at y. And so the final step are both main and x, which is what we did. Um, so in this other diagram, right, we're not going to stop B dagger at Y. We're going to stop B dagger at another place. That is to say, we're now going to do the diagram. So B dagger is stopped at X. So stop B dagger at X. Anyway, I don't, there's something screwy here in the notes. Anyway, so let's just uh, look at what it would be. It's S2 equals, and you need to go back to here. We're starting out here, minus E squared. Oh, well, we have to, we have to, In other words, we start here, right? Right. We start with this thing, so we would have minus e squared square root of two e's over square root of two e d two e q prime zero a prime integral time order power gamma mu d prime e to the minus i q prime x a mu x. So that's all the same. But um, uh, right, no. Sorry. Now we're stopping the um, dagger at y, and so it is this field, psi bar plus the denial that stops the dagger with a b. And so this thing, I shouldn't have written this thing automatic, this thing turns into um, an e to the minus i q x. And this is a plus sign, plus i q prime x, minus i q x, and then it would be a v bar. Okay. And then an a mu, and I might as well write an a mu of y there. Um, got the, the psi bar of y then is going to create the, um, the final fermion there. And let's, let's just keep track of these minus signs because what we were were here and we're saying that this guy is going to stop this one. And we see it introduces an overall minus sign, doesn't it? Because if this one stops this one, it has to go through here, right? So this is going to then be, instead of a minus sign, we're going to get a plus. And, um, And let me leave, leave the thing then as a side bar y, um, a gamma nu, and a u, and an e to the minus i py, a vacuum p4 x, p4 y. Okay. Um, 
Okay, the next thing is obviously this guy creates the thing that annihilates here. There's no trouble with minus signs, and so we get to E squared simply uh, vacuum. The A is gone. We have then um, V bar gamma mu. V prime e to the i, q prime minus q x, time order product a mu x, a mu y, e to the i y, p prime minus p, times u bar prime gamma nu u vacuum equals x. Now we substitute for this the, the, the propagator, which gives us the integral of d for a. And so we get this equal to e squared integral d for a. Oh my gosh, we're almost out of time. Divide the fourth, e minus i k, x minus y minus i is nu k squared. We'll leave out the minus i epsilon, the i epsilon. Well, um, v bar gamma nu prime, u bar prime gamma nu u, e to the i, q prime minus x plus y y minus p equal to x equal to y and so this is minus i e squared and we're looking for a four equal minus And v bar gamma mu v prime u bar prime gamma upper mu u e to the i e to the ah uh, well I wrote it in a neater way. It's, I guess I did the, or I did the, deep, I did the y integration. Over 
t minus p prime squared. All right, and the final answer is, um, this just gives you a delta function. So it's minus i e 2 pi to the 4 delta function of energy momentum p minus p prime squared and uh, as I said, mu bar prime gamma mu u. Well, and in front of it, it doesn't matter, of course. V, uh, v bar gamma mu uh, u bar prime. So all together, putting the two together, S is Um, I e squared um, two pi to the four delta function of energy conserving total energy momentum conservation. The first term was u bar prime gamma mu v prime v bar gamma mu u over p plus q squared. And the second term actually has a minus sign unless I screwed up the signs, which is possible. Uh, v bar gamma mu v prime u bar prime gamma mu u over p minus p prime squared. All right, so that's the total amplitude. Um, I'm a little suspicious of this minus sign because I don't really see a physical reason for it. So, um, extra credit, anybody who finds a minus sign mistake gets extra credit. All right, well, we're over time, so class dismissed. Do I owe anybody a candy?